So the the podcast the podcast has has ended. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just going to say again that um, it it it's from what's from Stephen sorry Sarah Spencer of Light, Lighthouse Lane, and the project I think this is the whole project is supported by the Creative Arc Program with funding from the University of Exeter and the Exeter City Council through a program of the UK Government Shared Prosperity Fund. But just as important, the guests have arrived. This podcast has allowed me to meet them at the uh, mysterious entrance to the <laughs> Phoenix in the basement. So would, would, would you introduce yourself, so start, starting with Karen? Okay, I'm Karen. I'm an English language teacher. Um, my background is literature and, and history, and I'm just, you know, I've always been fascinated in history. And this period in particular, because there's not very much documented of the time, you know, after Henry VIII's death and when Elizabeth I came on the throne. You know, we know it was Edward the the sixth, but he was eight, nine years old, so his uncle was his was protector. And it's really, really sketchy, that part of, of history. So it was really fascinating to discover that Sarah um, Dickinson had written this play based around that time, and that's one of the, the things that caught my interest when I, I got the email asking if I would be interested in taking part in this project. Steph. Hi, so I'm, I'm Stephanie Henshaw. Um, I'm an accountant, um, so I'm not the obvious person to be getting involved in theatre production, although actually I did some amateur dramatics oh, over 20 years ago now, um, up country when I was living in Buckinghamshire and then West London. So I spotted um, actually a tweet from the Exeter Northcott um, while I was on holiday in Cornwall in May asking for people to audition um, to be part of a community ensemble um, and it caught my interest because quite a few years ago Exeter Northcott did another community production it was called The Day We Played Brazil mm. there might be some people listening who remember that I remember and that I remember one. going to see it and wishing I'd realised it was happening because it looked like such fun to be part of a community production like that so the opportunity to audition to be part of a community ensemble um, was really exciting and mm. it whetted my appetite to take a step back onto the stage. Mm. Um, I think there were about 90 people auditioning and they didn't need everyone so yeah. it's a privilege to have even made it through that mm. and come to be in the production. Can I follow up on that? I was like you I did some amateur dramatics about 25 years ago and I've always wanted to go back into it but work really hasn't allowed me to do it you know full-time teaching but when this came up I thought no I'm it's about time you got back into it because like Stephanie I saw I also saw that play several years ago and I do a lot of voluntary work at the Northcott I'm a volunteer usher so you may recognize me when you see me on the stage from standing at the door I usually I'm usually standing at the door checking your tickets showing showing you to your seats this time somebody else is going to be doing that in my place so I, the, the impression I got last week, uh, there's, there's been a lot of interest in, in, in being part of this production from pe people. Well, I was, I, would have, I was going to say from Exeter, but you're not, you're not directly no. from Exeter. No, no, no. no I'm, I moved down here in 2007. <laughs> um, I'm an Essex girl originally. And um, I'm... And, Lon and then um, in and around London. Um, I mean, but my husband's from Devon, so we moved down together. Uh, I'm a Yorkshire lass by, by birth. Came down here in the 80s to go to university in Plymouth. Spent a lot of my time in Plymouth. Afterwards, via Italy and Spain, working, working there. And then um, in uh, late 2000s, I came back to Devon and um, settled in Exeter. So t I've been in now in Exeter for over 14 years. Well, you're more or less in Exeter then. Yes, but I'm but I'm not a local. I'm still an incomer. <laughs> okay. I'm still an incomer. I'm not, I'm not a local. Do you understand that? <laughs> so my, 
my stake in all of this is actually my great grandparents were Cornish. Uh, so are oh, you, right. And this play is, in, is, is, is made. You still be, won't be classed as a local stuff. No, I never <laughs> won't. But it and has, I never, made, has made me want to I never go back remember to the whether it's the history. Cornish or the De- uh, Devon that w- one's an Emmet and one's a Grockle, and I can never remember oh. which one's which. But oh. <laughs> I know. Oh, you need to know the right <laughs> way around. I know. Your right. and your grockles, it's like Aaron. it's like the scones, isn't it? Cream or jam oh, first. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Which is touched on briefly in the play. Yes, although it's not. I don't think that's. Well, no, it's a nice <laughs> reference. Well, it is a let, reference. Let me just ask, go back to a bit, bit of history, which you both might have a, an opinion on. Um, you, you mentioned Cornwall. The, the, the play is set in Cornwall, and it seems to me that what happens in Exeter happens by report. That that it's just events happen in Exeter, and then there's there's news about them, mm-hmm. and but the stage remains in Cornwall. Yes. That's because the community that the play is centred on is the community of Poundstock, which is where Sarah Dickinson, the playwright, mm. comes from, and it is and, a Cornish and village. Poundstock has um, the only remaining guild house which was something that was a very common community construction in the Middle Ages, but it's got the only one which is broadly used for the same purpose. Um, and it was completed not long before the events of the play um, in, in historical terms. Mm. So the completion of it is a, is a part of the story. Mm. So the community is centred there, but one of the key leaders in the community was then very much involved in the in 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 the um the yes. commotion time yeah. in the rebellion yeah. itself so the exeter side of it you're right you hear by report um but part of the interest for me is that the uh, the, the sort of final battle around exeter was up on cliss teeth mm. it's less than a mile from where i work every day so the idea for me that i'm sitting across the road and up the hill a bit from where the rebels made their their last formal stand against the government um, on the edge of Exeter. You know, it's very local. And their struggle was, this, it was the same struggle. They were fighting for the same cause. You know, they were, they were all being persecuted by the, by the government, by, you know, and, and for them to rebel and stand up against the status quo is something really admirable, you know, for that time. And the fact that it was mainly the women that that did it. Yes, the men went off to fight, but so did some of the women. But it was the women that were instrumental in getting their their men out onto the, the battlefield, getting this guild house built. So, at least in, so, in, in terms of the way the story is told. Uh, the way, it's, yes. I mean, true. we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I just, I just I just wonder his, historically, or even within the story, is the, is there no uh, support within Exeter for That's, a government point of view? Because if, there's a, if Exeter is being besieged, you would think there was somebody inside the city walls. That's one of the really interesting mm. things about it, that actually Exeter was divided over this. There were a lot of people within Exeter who were very much in support of what the, um, what the Devon and Cornish army, for want of a better word, was, was fighting for. But there were also a lot of people in the city who were not, and that included mm. some of the city leadership. So the mayor, as I understand it, and, and, and I'm trying to remember the bits I've read now, was um, absolutely determined to stay on the right side of the government. And you could say there's an element of self-preservation there. Mm-hmm. You know, I bend with the prevailing wind. It would not be in my interest to stand against Protector no. Somerset mm. um, and the people representing him. So he was very keen to keep the door, the, the gates of the city shut and suppress and of course once the rebellions happened and the rebels have been unsuccessful the narrative of those people takes over and they tell the story from yeah. their perspective which is these people were rebels what they yeah. was do- we were doing is wrong um, I believe John Hooker and there's a big statue of yes. him outside the cathedral yeah. yes. was he was strongly Protestant he was very anti the rebels and he was very clear that what they'd done was unacceptable oh, he- and of course he was one of the people who had the story to tell. Yes, he was. Um, but in, in so, just, so it, Exeter's position was quite quite equivocal in this. Um, and what you don't hear is the voices of the people within the no. city who would have supported because they weren't allowed out to and do And this that. is why this story is so poignant, I think, because you, 
you're seeing it from a perspective or hearing it from a perspective that you don't usually hear from. You know, the, and these people were getting, were rising up against the establishment. I just think it's amazing. I mean, I don't know enough about the John Hooker, but I do know a friend of mine, her husband is a great, great, great nephew of John Hooker. And she has mentioned him in the past, but I haven't seen her recently. So if you're listening, Rebecca, get in touch. <laughs> so, but no, it's just to see it, as I said at the beginning, there's not much out there about this period, you know, that, I think, and I think that's why people locally perhaps don't know. No, you know, if you if you go outside the city to um, uh, Cliff St Mary, or you go to Fenny Bridges, mm-hmm. there are plaques to the battles that took place there because mm. there were a series of them. But essentially, the rebels camped outside Exeter, yeah. and then they went out to try and meet the government forces because at that point the reports were that they were stronger. So there were a series of battles which were kind of um, not quite decisive, yeah. but obviously it meant that the, the rebels were being... Prepared. I think you'll find that people in the villages now will have a bit, will have more knowledge. They'll have that knowledge, historical knowledge. People in Exeter, perhaps not so much for two reasons. One, because it all happened outside the ex- Exeter walls, and two, because, well, I'm one of them, that a, a large percentage of the Exeter population are not Exeter born and bred. We've come in, as I was saying before, we're incomers. I think that has, may have a bearing on it. There's a wider point here about the way that history gets taught. As well. You know, the, w- the way we're taught history in schools mm. is very much a series of kind of high profile things. Mm-hmm. So when you when you learn about the Tudors in school, yeah. you know you learn about Henry VIII, yeah. and, his yeah. and you learn wives. about Elizabeth the, and his six wives, and you learn about Elizabeth I and the Spanish Armada. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's very, it's very kings based, it's not very people. from the position of the leaders. Mm. But actually, you've got to you've got to be a real sort of passionate historian to then dig underneath mm. and go well how does this work at a more local yeah. level what about and i'll give you a completely different example mm. so i'm an essex girl okay. i went to school in south end now our playwright sarah dickinson is a dramaturg which means she helps bring plays to life ordinarily yeah she's had a parallel project at the moment working at the globe theater on a story called the essex princess which oh. is about a, um, an African woman who pretended to be a princess in the very late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and I think won, a, won an early sort of beauty pageant type thing in South End and was, was a local celebrity. Now, having been born and brought up there, I knew absolutely no. nothing about no. this story until I was looking at what sort of thing mm. Sarah was working on and went, oh my goodness, this is, you know, a, was a, a local mm. celebrity relatively recent history never heard of it but you think about it you're talking about the history we're taught that is perhaps a failing of the education system when it comes to history because as you say we're taught king 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 queen queen king what about the everyday person you know who was toiling away trying to make ends meet we don't hear about them very often so it is it's refreshing Mm. it's really refreshing and um, I hope there are more people out there more historians, historical buffs, playwrights like Sarah, who will do this. So hopefully this will reach enough people that someone will think, oh, I wonder about my, there was something that happened in my, my town. I wonder if I could find, it would be, it's just really refreshing. I have to give credit. The Essex Princess is not Sarah's play. It's written by somebody else, but, um, a woman of colour. Mm-hmm. And I'm really sorry, I can't remember her but name never, at the moment. But no. Never mind. I mean, it's still coming from the same, same place. place. It's isn't coming it? from people yeah, telling their she, own stories. But as, as I understand it, a dramaturg is somebody who really writes or, or well, well, helps, make, to, helps to bring help, to help, helps to make it work on that and bring place. it to life. I suppose. Yes. Yeah, that's there are my all understanding. Sorts of stories I think out there that could be told. And, and I'll go back to the one I referenced originally, the day we pray, played Brazil. Mm. I had no idea until I went to see that play that Exeter City were the first football team to go to Brazil and introduce football to the Brazilians effectively. No, I now, wasn't. You know, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't The either. dominant this force in world football. Yeah, I know. It's an extraordinary it's, case. It's something you would <laughs> think this, really? No, that, no, no that's, I'm sorry. Um, 
I'm not going to go into whether I believe that or not. <laughs> but, but, but I love, but I but, love, but I love the angle on it. It go, was well, actually this is a piece of history we should be quite proud of. Yes, certainly. yes. And there's a story to be told about those men and what happened mm. to them afterwards. Um, which, you know, I suspect local people didn't know. Yeah. And yeah. that's where so, this is really, sorry, is really, really good. Going back to Poundstock, the people of pa- Poundstock, mu- I imagine, must have been proud of their history anyway. But now they must be super proud. And the fact that they are all, well, there's, I don't know how many now. I've lost, I've forgotten how many. Friday night, opening night. There's a coming, coach load there's of them There's a coach load down. of them coming. Oh, I went right. up, I went up, um, oh, a couple of months ago, myself and Liz, who was here last week, and, yes. um, and and Helen, who is in the choir. We went up about two months ago. We took a day trip. We drove up, I drove up to Bude in my car that's just about to give up the ghost. And we went to Poundstock for the day. We saw the Guild House. It was it was lovely. It was lovely meeting some of the ladies, and they said, "Oh yes, we're all coming. We're coming to to watch you." And it was and the I must admit I walked into this guild house and I the feeling that came over me I can't I couldn't explain it, but it was just atmospheric. You know, you could feel the history going that was coming from the walls because it what hadn't after being built obviously it was used as a celebration place it was used for meetings probably religious gatherings but it also later on in um following centuries was used to house people you know pe- it was used as an arms house or similar you know it's even to this day it's still being used and as steph said a few minutes ago it's the only one left that's still standing. So it's a community hall, basically. Guildhouse is is, I'd say, is a you could say it's a community hall. Mm. It's a building for ev- for everybody to use. And the, and that is the the stage setting and stage. Yes, setting yes. Throughout. We are in the in the guild hall, so it's where the ty- the meetings would have happened. It's where the authorities, when they were coming, demanding you know the money and from from the villagers. It's when all the villagers went at harvest time, for example, when all the the harvest had been brought in and they were tallying up how much they'd made. That's where everybody, that's about, that's the, the village folk met. They'd, they'd be, there'd probably be a huge table in the length of the room. Think of it, the old, the films, the old. Banqueting films, halls. Banqueting halls. You'd have the table with, with the wooden benches all around, and that's where we're sitting on the wooden benches. We are the village folk. Well, the, well, the, the story is about us building it, actually, it's about, yeah. to, to be able to do those yeah. things. And it's it's where it's the commu- it's the community meeting house. That's what a guild hall, a guild house is. It's yes. Right. It had, well, a, it had I, a little bit more to it may, originally because ooh. it was it was also a way of. Um, raising money to yes. pay for masses for the souls of the of the dead and that's part of what the protestant tradition objected to and they were trying the to community was raising money by holding events mm. which they would then use to pay for masses or to you know buy extra things for their church and and of course the state's view was no you can't have all that because that's money to the church mm. we want the money for the state yes so the other the other element to um, what created the rebellion was that Somerset wanted to prosecute a war against the Scots and he Mm. needed taxes to pay for that. So they taxed the people really heavily. There's a reference at one point to the sheep tax having gone up, wool tax, Mm. everything that could be taxed was taxed on these these communities. And then they came in and said, and we'll have all the wealth from your church and your guild house. and they they dressed it up as because this is this is you know popery and mm-hmm. the but church is corrupt. But actually, they wanted money. The for driver them. was there's a lot of silver here, and we can take yeah. that. And we can use that. To and that was not, that was not unique in history. That if you look throughout history, that has always been the case, hasn't it? They they need money for their wars. For the the government want the money, and who where do they get it? They get it from the, the ordinary people. ordinary common common man, woman. So I'm 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 convinced, at least for the purpose of the play, that's that's where the location is and yes. that's where the community is. Yeah. Yes. So whether the actual situation in Exeter was more complicated, 
That's, that, that happens doesn't, off. That doesn't really matter. That happens off. Play. That happens off scene, off stage. Right. It, I suppose so it's, it's, not, does it's not a main part. Of no, no, what's no. Going on anyway. No, no. It does matter in in the sense of the arc of the story mm. because the the fact that Exeter was, and I'm going to use the phrase locked down because you know, yes. that will resonate with people. It's a siege, isn't it? The, it so is a siege. The city that's, is so. under siege and you have supporters and detractors within the city. Mm. It's actually part of why the rebellion didn't work because elsewhere in Devon, people were absolutely on board with it. The, mm. the trigger point actually for, for people arming was the, the men of Samford Courtney mm-hmm. who rose up and said, that's it, we've had enough. And that was where actually the first flames of the rebellion mm. came from. Um, and that definitely features. Yeah. And then villages like Poundstock ca- followed through. But Exeter was, that's why it's called the Siege of Exeter. And it's a, that's a term that is used by historians. OK, well, I think we've, we, we'll, we'll regard that as complete as yeah. for, for okay. the moment. Anyway, that's fine. As a discussion. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> You, you were talking earlier about the, your experience of the rehearsals and the, the, the technical aspects mm. of, of the production. Having just um, gone, th- had our first two tech rehearsals and the dress rehearsal is tonight, yes. So I suppose for, for anyone who's not participated in a production like this before, um, it's very easy to think it sort of comes to the stage. You, know, <laughs> so you, you see the end product and not the work mm. that goes behind it um, so there's that we've had weeks of sort of once a week rehearsal and then on a Sunday a lot of which weren't done in the performance space at the Northcott they were done at the Barnfield so you're working in a room um, where you're using chairs to denote mm. sort of broadly what the set is going to and look probably, like you don't necessarily have the space it's about probably about a third of the site the space at the north Cock, yes it's a lot smaller yes. you haven't got wings when you're trying to go on and off basically <laughs> we're all sort of huddling to the side so although we can we can set all the moves and build the characters it's only when you get into the performance space that you get a sense of really how things mm. fit together um technical rehearsals are actually where the actors and the stuff we've been rehearsing is then put together with the sound the lighting the set the props mm. um, and you can be and, and actually the focus of a technical rehearsal isn't on us the performers it's on all those other bits that are an absolutely essential part of making the production work so mm. a technical rehearsal is very stop start because it's a disembodied voice saying, yeah, can we do that again? Because yeah. actually the, the person operating the lights wants to adjust the lighting or um, the stage manager says, no, we need to do that again mm. because actually we had too many people in the way when we brought that table on, so we need to yeah. adjust that. It's also the director looking at it from the audience, you know, right up and going, does that scene work? Are those people standing mm. in the right place? Do I need to move we that person here or that, that person, person there? there? And mm. we've got audience sitting on the stage with the action. Yes. 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 So things like, well, actually, are we blocking the view mm. of part of the audience? Which is interesting because last night, Christine and I, uh, towards the end, we need to be w- with the audience. And we stood in our space and then we looked back and went, ah, we've got audience behind us. We're blocking them. So it's those little, little things. So we did a little... We did a little shuffle, but but the tech, as Steph was saying, the first night, to some people might have seemed, oh, what happened here? Fe- well, I did. It fe- felt as if I was on a loop, as you say. The lady Kate was going stop. St- we'll start again. Stop. But it was, and you you didn't necessarily know why, and it wasn't necessarily that you or your colleagues had done something wrong in inverted commas. It was. As, you, as Steph was saying, she was. They were looking at the bigger picture, and looking that well, that X needs to be in place of Y, and Y needs to move a, a couple of centimeters to the left. And can we can we get all those things onto the stage and off yes. again in the time available? Do we need to adjust how that scene works? So that was the first one on Tuesday night, and then last night we had our second tech where we ran through, I'd say, pretty much all of the play, more or less in order, but a couple of things were repeated, and then at the end, a few, a couple of scenes were talked about just with the, the few characters that needed 
needed uh, instruction on what to do with that because we had to stay behind just for 10 minutes afterwards. So it's, it is, as Steph said, it's hard work. It's, um, it is hard work. I know a few people said to me yesterday, gosh, I went home on Tuesday and I was exhausted. What Was it Liz? Somebody said to me, says, I just went and made myself a big cup of tea. <laughs> I didn't think I would sleep with it. And she says, I didn't wake up until the alarm went off the next morning. <laughs> I just thought, <laughs> yeah, it was, but it's been it's fun it's as the well. concentration. It um, is concentration. And I have to say, um, you know, there's technical skills, but actually the people management skills. Oh my goodness. For director, stage manager, um, wardrobe, drops, wardrobe well, yeah, designer, um, to be able to marshal not just your principals who are professionals and are used to doing this stuff, but this cut but community 50, ensemble 50 who've people. got varying <laughs> experience of yep. being on stage and the choir mm. and marshal us all around mm. and make sure that you know we're doing the right thing that when when it's paused we understand you know what's going on and and then we're ready to go again. You know, you've got to be mm. you've got to be very good at coordination, communication, keeping calm. Yeah. You it's, know, there's no there's no shouting at anybody or anything like no. that. It's just and touch wood, really it, focused. it is it's go it is going smoothly. It has gone smoothly. It's going smoothly, and I'm sure tonight's dress rehearsal, our first dress full dress rehearsal, run through from beginning to end. I'm sure will be yes. It's Good. easy for people to think the dress rehearsal is just about putting the costumes on, but actually we've already done <laughs> we've that. done that. This is about putting the whole, whole thing, thing together, together. Yes. And, and performing it as though there were an audience there. So tomorrow yes. night, when because our first audience arrives, because that's it, we're, there, we're ready after, to go. After tonight right. at ten o'clock, so, when Martin says that's it, we'll get a few. We'll obviously be told a few bits and pieces, and we'll be, and then that's it. Go away, go home, mull it over. And come in tomorrow night at six o'clock. Get into those costumes. And get into those characters. And yes. that's it. And you've got several performances. If you say we you're have. exhausted with a rehearsal. Yes. I think by Sunday evening that's but, going to be quite a challenge. Because we have two performances on Saturday and two on Sunday. It's not just tomorrow. Obviously, Thursday, Friday night is the first night. And it, it's sold out. Although I do believe now there are one or two tickets that have been returned but then we've got Saturday matinee Saturday night Sunday matinee Sunday night they're giving us a rest on Monday Phew. and then Tuesday night and Wednesday night so if you haven't bought your tickets already this is a message from everybody in the cast and direction please go out and buy your ticket so there are some there are some um, there are not on Friday. Well, Friday Fr ones, it's, they seem to be a sort of trade in them. I think on. Friday yes. night is sold out. I think, well, I think the people of Poundstock are probably <laughs> responsible they've, for that. They've certainly helped contribute. And I know so. I'm responsible for about 14 people. A, a friend of mine is bringing a group of 14 people from her French um, twinning group. So, <laughs> but I believe, you know, we were told Friday was sold out. But I have heard through the grapevine that there are a couple of of spares now because I've got one uh, a friend of mine has returned one but and I, I, if I remember correctly as well um, yes I mean I was on the back Tuesday evening's performance after the performance the historian Mark Stoyle yes. is actually going to explore some of the play's themes and talk about some of the background and to it. so if you're genuinely grabbed by the yeah. the historical background to this coming along on mm. Tuesday night and staying for that talk could be really interesting if you can't um, I discovered yesterday, and I put it on our WhatsApp, he's actually done a YouTube video, and he's filmed it in the Guild, Iowa Guildhall here in Exeter. It's on YouTube. There is, Mark Stoyle is talking about the play and the commotion time and that period of history. I can leave the link. But the other thing was, was it about, again, two months ago, he came to one of our rehearsals. I think, I'm not sure if that was when you were, were you weren't there. And he talked to us about the period. He answered questions about costumes, about music of that period. He is the leading expert of, of this period in time. So come along, yes, on Tuesday. If you can't, as I say, there's the YouTube um, link. I can leave it with, well, with you, I, Will. I think, um, I should... 
if it's the one I'm thinking of, it's Northcott Theatre. Yes. People look for Northcott Theatre. Yes, it's the yeah. Northcott. And there's, there's interviews with the, I think, with the director. Yes. That's there is that one, but this was another one. He's actually um, Mark is in the Guildhall. He's being he's talking in the Guildhall. The little trailer was from the Guildhall. He and then he's walking out of the barnfield, but he does have a a, a YouTube mm. um, interview yes, about so it's a nice as well. snippet where he. He shows a bit of the city wall that was actually damaged yes. in the siege. Oh, right. And of course, I Exeter think... City Wall is a patchwork of history and stories about oh. the different things that happened. Yes. Um, yes. In fact, when I moved to Exeter, it was one of the red coat tours that was the first thing that mm. opened my eyes to just, you know, how much there was to learn about the city. Yes. Um, from being having it pointed out to me where the Roman blocks are in the wall and then the later building and then the damage from the rebellion from mm. the civil war um fascinating it is fascinating the city wall is a it is itself got, tells the story i did that tour when i first came to exeter as well mm. very mm. interesting and i've done it again myself and i've done it with a group of friends and it's just it's just fascinating wherever you go a little bit of wall and through my teaching teaching overseas students I ran a course about, um, it was called, um, it was cultural studies, and I used to bring my students into Exeter and do various things, and one of the things I did was take them round the wall, and about, we talked about Roman Exeter, but it's still the wall, so. Sure. I'm just looking uh, for that link, for this, it's, um, it is an, an Exeter Northcott reel, but it's Mark Stoyle, talking I, about I the, think the... I think the easiest thing to do is just say Exeter North... If people get to YouTube and search for Exeter Northcott, yes. it's, the late, it's the latest one they've uploaded. Yeah. Yes, so although it does... It's very straightforwardly. It think. does say Facebook as well on it, on the link, interestingly. Well, yeah, the, the, I'm, 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 I'm going to say go straight to yeah. YouTube. I'm sure they'll find it. <laughs> I'm sure. Type in You're, YouTube, Mark Stoyle commotion time Exeter I'm sure Northcott. ex good Northcott we'll, those we'll, keywords should, we'll, should get we'll, there we'll find it yeah. we'll, I, we ought to finish in about 10 minutes okay. but because we need to get ready for the next sh the wild show at 10 o'clock mm -hmm. but we might go a little bit over because they're very nice people on the, on the wild show the, <laughs> the producer may arrive but Ooh. he's a very kind gentleman. And <laughs> I don't want to trespass on no, somebody no, else's slot. No, not at all. So what um, else would you like to know then? Well, I'd like to talk about the music and okay. also about social media and content marketing, which you've done a little bit of. Mm. So that if you've got a, a talk on YouTube with the historical background, um, that, is, that is a sort of giveaway. Mm. Although people can buy a ticket for Tuesday and they'll get a longer version mm. um, but what I would say usually or what my expectation would be if it's a musical um, I'll use the word loosely because th this is more of a composition yes um, it may not be you may not regard it in the same way as a, as a, a being a musical I suppose music is is mm. part of telling a story. Mm, it's and, not a And musical. there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, one one is because it, the score that kind of runs through and provides the, mm. you know, the sort of atmospheric music at various points, you know, that does help to, yeah. to build the, um, the the story of the play. But it's not but a also musical. also, actually, singing was an important mm. thing for a community like this. You know, you have to remember we're talking about the part of the services, mid to late it? 16th century. It would be part of the religious it services. It would be part of the services, but it was also part of how they celebrated. Mm. So um, our community choir, at, at one point where we have a scene set around Christmas, sings a 16th century, or a, a, at least a 16th century Christmas carol. Mm. Um, and carols originally were songs that you also, you know, danced to, so mm. they were quite jolly. They weren't necessarily... Um, religious themed. When no. I say Christmas Carol now, people think about things like Away in a Manger and Once in Royal David City. The, they're they're much not. more recent no. creations. The Victorians mm. liked to have things that were much more sort of sentimental. Right. And it was a good space. Music as well and singing brought the community together. I mean, you, yeah. it would can, be their way of entertainment. Can, can we just concentrate on, on what people might experience? If they buy a ticket and okay, go, to yeah. the, go to the theatre. Mm. 
uh, they will experience some sort of music okay. as part of. Yeah, so there is music at various points, points in the production, which mark the stages of the year. Mm. So supporting um, elements of the religious festival, mm. but there, there's then also music Christmas. Um, and then there's 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 music to mark dramatic moments in the play, and there is and a it's score. Been written originally for the so the it's all written for the production, with the exception of the carol I mentioned by Ben Suckley, mm. who's our musical you see, director. You see, um, just to explain the way I'm sort of thinking about it, um, Folly FM is is mostly mostly a music mm -hmm. channel, right? Okay, so. We've got a benefit coming up, Dr. Feelgood, uh, 23rd <laughs> November. Okay. So oh, we lovely. will play tracks. Mm. Uh, so people who are thinking of buying a ticket to right. Dr. Feelgood will know, roughly speaking, what Dr. Feelgood sounds like. Okay, if, they, yeah. if they don't already, mm. we'll remind them. And if you go to see Jersey Boys, yes. you know most of the songs. And there's no damage mm. done. Mm in hearing the songs before you go to the theatre or buy a ticket. Can I sort of... So I've been very crude, I, but yeah, I'm just making... I suppose because those are music events, whereas this is, as you were saying, it's a play and it, with music in it. I, but just before we came on air, you know, the podcast that you had going, yes. you had the, the song Nunc Dimittis, it was playing in the background. That is one that I think is the one that goes through the whole play so when you you were saying the score Steph the score going through you'll hear the the little bit of music in the background as the characters are doing whatever they're doing at that point in the play that's what you will hear and that is that has been um although it is a long-standing it's a prayer isn't it Ben has rewritten the music he's written the music specifically for our play so it's that it's 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 really hard i think for us to give you any music beforehand because it's it's integral to the the play but i think if we gave it to you beforehand it might it might spoil it it might be a spoiler and because it's because it, it's repeated as a score I don't know if I'm making sense. It's, but that was definitely, as I said before, we came on air. I heard it in the background, and so if anybody was listening before, they will have heard that. I think picking up your point about, you know, people go to musicals; they're familiar. Mm. Um, there's two things. One is there are a lot of musicals which are broadly jukebox musicals. So essentially, they've taken popular songs and turn them mm. into a story and people know the song before they go and yes. then you have things that were written specifically as a musical where the songs have become well known yeah this is a brand new play with brand new music, music written specifically for it so it's not something where you know the audience will go oh i recognize that tune mm. um it's it, it it's sort of situation specific to a certain extent but i think as the the score is played throughout people will be it will be there in the background so that when it comes to the point where the choir and the rest of us are singing it will it will have some there will be some sort of subconscious familiarity i think i guess in terms of style if people are interested in kind of the the, the, the style behind the music, um, and and I have to I haven't I haven't talked to Ben in detail about it, so I'm talking about what I can hear in there. But so he's just, using just, just, just just say a bit more about Ben. So Ben Sutcliffe is our musical director. He's um, Cornish. Mm -hmm. um, he's obviously got quite a um, you know long pedigree of writing original music and and directing music. Multi talented musician. He's playing quite a plethora of instruments mm. during the course and of the singing, production and he's and singing as well so you know he himself is a is a you mm. know, is, 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 is an integral part of the performance he's on stage with us he's he's led the, led the choir yeah you can hear in the music influences of kind of folk tunes as something that sounds very almost kind of hornpipe mm. at one point you know there's so also that's little bits of modern there's a bit there's, of modern music you can hear modern strains of music as well it really is a mixture isn't it and, it's and then a 
there is a there is a final song um, which brings the threads of the production which together. Which I don't think we should say... And I'm not going to say I any more about it. Than all that. I will say, mm. which I think will be OK, is that the singing, there is singing in English, in Latin and in Cornish. Because... A teeny bit of Cornish. Teeny, but it, there is... Oh, but all three are featured and I don't think we should say anything else about the the final well, you song. Did, you, did, you did mention that some of the music exists in WhatsApp groups. There is a sort of underground... Well, well, that's, that's for the choir. The that's for the choir. When the choir the were cast. practicing, you know, they were they were sending oh. each other, you know, recordings for them learning. Well, all, all, I'm, all I'm going to say now, maybe may a little bit subtler than my references to Jersey Boys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, wouldn't want people, I wouldn't want people to think that we're suddenly going to burst no. into 1960s I think, Americana. I think we no, do need to make no. it clear that it is not, it's not a musical that's been written or it's an original design. production, I, I think. It's, mm. Oh yes, I'm, I'm, I understand it's an original production, but how, how, how do you persuade people to buy tickets? Oh, how do we persuade so, well, people to buy tickets? Bearing in mind, can I just explain yeah. this? Because I've been doing the drama show on Follow FM for a while, and in some cases I've, I've worked out how to persuade drama companies to supply me with bits of sound. Mm -hmm. Because on a, on a very... You, you, I, well, I sound sort of stupid re repeating this, but I just keep on with it. A, tr a, a radio show is made up of bits of sound. Mm -hmm. and if, if you want to keep it going for a couple of hours... Um, buy another ticket. It's going to be really good. Yeah. Repeated endlessly doesn't doesn't really keep no. the audience. No. Well. So, um, I just want to mention there's a there's a group called the Digital Culture Network who are going to be at the Barnfield this evening. Yes, I at saw that. Five thirty. It's completely free, and I think there are still tickets, and. They are. They include content marketing within their scope, and they're funded by the Arts Council, and they're there to uh, support drama companies, cultural enterprises in promoting their work. And th this idea that the aud the audience is obliged to buy a ticket and go to the theatre, and then they will discover what it is. I think it's more a case of us being a little bit nervous because we haven't cleared in advance. No, yeah, any bits no, yeah. Of music. But this is this is you're doing the dress rehearsal this evening. <laughs> yes. So so in the in the culture of the theatre, if I can put it that way, um, that's it, not a criticism of them. That's more our incompetence in not no, 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 yeah, no, no. came along. No, it was you, right you, so. you, you are not the marketing department of the Northcott Theatre. No. You, you, you and unfortunately, Grace couldn't um, join us today as well. She's had to. No. She's been called into tech. Right. <laughs> but you look, you may say that in this particular instance, you it's absolutely right that no other than this podcast, which I've been able to play, um, but I've played it complete. I think if I just said I wanted the music and taken out two minute chunks throughout the mm. podcast, that would have been much more difficult to a, a, arrange. So let's say the marketing policy is that the music is completely unknown and comes as a surprise. That that's sounds that's good. really I what you. I think that's, that's fair. Yeah, and I think that's that's a. That's I think fair. that's fair right. because it, okay. it is when you think about it. It is. I mean, there's also a danger that actually playing some of it almost acts as spoilers. Well, as we were saying. Okay. Yeah. I mean, people have asked me what's the play about, and so. I've given a synopsis of the play, and people are going, oh, that's interesting. I don't know much about that. I'm saying, well, go online, have a look. Ha you know, go and read up I a do, little I bit do, more I, about it. I'll just, I'll just say something which, which I've, I found also amazing. In, in terms of content marketing, the, 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 the balance is to give away something and hope that you can persuade people to get to pay for something a bit more. Mm. So this idea of the, the YouTube video the history... Mm -hmm background when there's going to be a longer talk on Tuesday that that would sort of fit into mm -hmm. content marketing as it's supposed to be and the BBC spotlight on Tuesday night you know at six thirty the six thirty though there was a feature on it as well so people could find that on our yes. player oh yes, yes. I mean my fr as we were going into re tech rehearsals I happened to look at my phone and a friend said you're there's a, a feature on um, spotlight now 
So at the end of the rehearsal, I s- sent the link out to everyone and people were able to find so it. About 15 right. minutes into the programme. Yes. Right. Well, j- just, just to mention this, um, The Real Inspector Hound, which was a, a production by Extra Drama Company, mm-hmm. I found a complete version of that online, on, on YouTube, and I thought that would give people a good idea if they wanted to go and see it. And then I was like, oh, no, 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 that's a spoiler. Yes. <laughs> Tell them not to watch it. It's, it's, <laughs> diff- it's a little bit about telling people who did it in the mouse it's, trap. It's, you know, it's, it's even difficult. though it's been around a long time. It's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult to know how much how much to talk about, how much to give away, give away in inverted commas. You know, how much do you say? And also, as you say, when we're not sure exactly how much we can. No. It's, no. But, but I think... Um, In terms of other, I mean, you talk about the sort of social media side of it, and we were encouraged to Mm. um, share, talk about on our own social media, um, the production, the experience of being part of it, um, you know, generally get information out there about the fact Mm. that it's happening, and people have done that different ways. Um, Personally, I've I've, I've actually done a tweet every week after rehearsal. Right. Just... And, you know, I haven't got millions of followers or anything like that. You Whereas know, I'm, I'm, I have. You know, I'm just somebody, you know, doing my mm. bit on social Whereas media. Whereas I've been doing it. But, but actually tagging in the theatre, the playwright, the director, mm. right. other so, cast members. I mean, that's um, great. Talking about, you know, the experience of, of, of learning, mm. the, learning the songs we've learned. So I've sort of used that as a way of mm. telling people about the production. And I suppose trying to trying to infuse them a bit about it from from the point of view of, of being a participant in the community ensemble and, and mm. that's sort of my my view on it. Yes, so it's yeah. all hashtagged with the commotion. Whereas I've, I've done it through Facebook, I've done it through email uh, with colleagues, with different WhatsApp groups that I'm, I'm a member, you know, I'm, I'm part of, different groups that I run. I run a couple of language, foreign language conversation groups on, on, on a weekend, so but people doing it that way actually talking to people telling people and you know people are interested oh that sounds interesting oh. look that, that that that's what that seems and it does seem to be working it does yeah. seem to be working yeah. we can we can say that tickets are disappearing and if, they if, are. If people, definitely if people want want the ticket they should get yeah. it fairly soon i think i well also because we open tomorrow night yes obviously um you know we'd like to have as many bums on seats as possible mm. but, the productions on Saturday, performances on Sunday, and then Tuesday. You don't Wednesday want to be week. performing to an empty auditorium. I've done it for. I've seen it before when I've been volunteering as an usher. You go in and the auditorium is empty. I've seen it at the Barnfield so many times, and you just think, those poor actors on stage looking out, and they see a dozen people in the auditorium. You don't want that. You want the seats, the seats full. Sure, sure. I, I've just had one one other thought. But um, you're saying there is a there is a Christmas Carol, yes, mm-hmm. well, which Christmas which is an six, original one, original 16th it, it, century. It, it, yes, it's not been written for the production. It's no. it's it's a traditional. Sorry, not a, traditional n- not original because that means he's been mm. created recently. So that, that, it's tr- a traditional 16th century Christmas so, Carol. I think we so, can say what so, that is, can't we? Probably. Yeah, that, so, it's called Tomorrow Will Be My Dancing Day. Um, oh. It's not what people would think of as a Christmas Carol, but no. it's a Carol in the original sense. Um, it's that off the era. People would have joined hands and danced while singing. So it. there's no copyright on that. Yeah. So we could find another version. You could find of another it. version of it. Not that we're going to. No. But that's that but might that's, be open but, to discussion. Yeah, but that's that, but peop- that, that's. I that. suppose people could, if anyone's interested, they might go and have a listen to it, and it might be it'd be interesting to see whether. It would, for them, whether it was the same verse, same music, How that it, oh, it is the the tune is, is the same. same. I mean, I've yeah. heard, I remember hearing um, there's a, um, a a trio that comes to, came, used to come to the Barnfield every Christmas time and do a um, medieval Christmas and a Victorian Christmas alternate years. Uh-huh. Uh, embarrassingly, can't remember their name. They were great, oh, I don't and remember that them. was one that they did. Oh. Oh. Right. So that was the first place I heard it, you see, and then when it cropped up in the production, I thought, oh, I've actually got that on a CD at home. Oh, that's interesting, because that was the first time I'd ever heard, when I, I heard it, I thought, oh, that's pretty. Okay. But I didn't well, realise. Uh, we've, got, we've got about a minute and a half. Okay. Um, so I'll just say that I think this, this should be discussed 
Elevate and Ace Growing Your Digital Work is at the Barnfield at 5.30 and we will discuss why Commotion Time uniquely is the only production which should not be promoted through advanced music. Well, I'm... I think you'd have to talk to the production team about that. Yes, so I, I mean that could be that could be our. Well, this is the la- this is the end of the drama show ahead yeah. of the event. So yeah. what we say next week doesn't matter, really. No, does it? Yes, it will be very different, won't it? Yeah. <laughs> but so, so what we would say is it's original uh, uh, with the absent uh, the, uh, absent that ca- that Carol. It's original music written for the production. Um, an to, original to provide the, the 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 atmosphere and to to capture the story. Right. Um, yes. But I think people will be impressed I th- at what's being produced. Yeah. I'm sure there will be. Um, I hope so, and I hope all our hard work at selling tickets pays off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also hope we do justice to the to, to the, Sarah to the to the playwright to right. Sarah Dickinson. Got 15 this comes seconds from. Now. Yes, and all I can say it's. I and it's been an absolutely brilliant experience. It's be been fantastic. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Said. Still enjoying it. And, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Can't... Thank you very much for coming. You're welcome. Thank it's you. It's been, been brilliant. Thank and you. I'm sure that t- I, I think the ticket's probably all gone by now. <laughs> probably. <laughs>